Hi, my name is Chloe Herman and I'm a third year PhD student in Greg Cabarese's lab and a National Microbiome Data Collaborative Ambassador. And today I'm here to teach you guys a little bit about standardizing metadata. So just a quick overview of the training. We're gonna go through the NMDC mission, data lifecycle, data, best ma uh, data management best practices. And then we're gonna talk about a little bit about what are metadata and what are the community standards currently and then um, we are going to get a little bit into the weeds on what's required for standardizing metadata before looking at the NMDC portal and finally jumping into some example sample metadata for us to mess around with and standardize. So first I just want to talk briefly about the NMDC mission. The NMDC mission is to provide fair multiomics microbiome data um, by leveraging best practices for data management such as curation and processing. And so um, FAIR is an acronym that the NMDC will uh, uses a lot and I'll be using a lot in this video. And it stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So let's now talk about data life cycles. So a data life cycle ideally looks like this, where the data is created, processed, analyzed, and then preserved so that other people can access it and reuse it. Um, but I think it mostly looks like this, where the focus is on creating the data, processing the data, and analyzing the data for your own project, but not really on preserving the data or for um, other people to reuse that data. But if you've ever done a metadata analysis, you've tried to reuse data, and you've found that it can be really tricky. It kind of looks something like this, where source A and source B are very closed off from target C and target D, and there's no standards for talking about the data or for the person's workflow. And so there's no um, real understanding of what's happening in between these researchers. And so what we're trying to do is adopt standards so that it, our data access and reuse looks a little bit more like this, where there's a standard that everyone follows and therefore target C and target D can easily understand what's happening when, while source A and source B are collecting their data. And that's what the NMDC team is working on. They're working on standardizing metadata to solve ac uh, problems with access and reuse. And that really involves focusing on data preservation, access, and data reuse. And this is really important in two major steps. When you're creating the data, it's important to collect sample metadata that it has categories that are standardized. And when you're submitting sample metadata to make sure, or when you're submitting data to make sure you have sample metadata with it that is standardized, that can be used to talk about your data. And this can all happen in your experimental design stage where you're being really intentional about, intentional about collecting, storing, and processing your data. Um, and it, it's um, very easily written into your data management plan for your samples. All right, so with data management best practices, it's really important to be intentional about the process of collecting and storing, processing, and protecting your data. And for data preservation, um, it's important that your data is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable for now and in the future. And good data management plans follow FAIR principles and usually involve standardization. So good data management allows for better science by enabling data sharing and data reuse. I think the benefits of um, good data management plans and uh, increasing reusability of data is like almost immeasurable, but um, data being discoverable, being more accessible, being more comparable, and the impacts of your work can be even greater. It can increase your scientific exposure. It can help to make sure that your data and work is appropriately credited and um, the impact of your data and work is like measurable because you can see how many people are using your data um, to answer their research questions. So I've talked a lot about metadata, but let's go a little bit deeper into what are metadata. So metadata are all of the contextual information about your data. 
And this is vital for data preservation, data discovery, data access, and data reuse because it gives all the context for your sample and your data. There's a ton of different types of metadata, sample metadata, preparation metadata, data processing, and feature metadata. But uh, all of these are, are really important, but we're specifically going to focus on sample metadata. So sample metadata is the metadata that includes when the sample was collected, where it was collected, what kind of sample it is, what treatment, and what environmental properties that the, um, of the place that the sample was taken. And so um, you might be kind of asking why metadata standards or like what is this, what issue is this solving? And so this is kind of uh, an example of that. So say I am doing a meta-analysis on the gut microbiome and I'm looking for data to use. So I type into the database fecal and I would find the scientists on the left's data, but I wouldn't find the scientists on the right's because even though these words are basically synonyms, uh, the computer would only be searching for fecal because that's what I typed in. And so I would be missing um, half of this data that is available, I just can't find it. And so adopting standards means that we're all using the same terminology, which makes finding this data really easy. So in this case, I'm using fecal to search for this data and they're both uh, using the term fecal to describe their data, and so I would be able to find this data for my meta-analysis easier. And so this really supports this FAIR term that um, we've been talking about, this findable specifically, because I can search and discover based on any um, information that would be found in your standardized metadata, like when, where, what kind of sample, and what properties of the environment. So let's dive into some microbiome metadata community standards. So the NMDC is utilizing existing community standards. The three um, existing community standards that they're using is the MIX-S environmental package, the GOLD ecosystem pathway, and the IMBO-TRIAD environmental ontology. So from these community standards, the NMDC is deriving what they're calling their mandatory metadata. And so from the mixed S and Invo triad, which are in combined in the, the mixed S environmental standards, um, we'll get information about the sample, like the sample ID and the collection date and the geographic location. And the Invo triad will get uh, an ontology that describes the environmental context of your sample. And then unique to the NMDC, their mandatory metadata will also include this gold ecosystem, which includes a five-level ontology to describe the context of your data. Um, so the mixed S environmental package is a system of standards that are used to describe diverse environments. And the mixed S packages refer to environments as packages, and um, they'll have a list of metadata descriptors that are necessary for each package. Uh, the mixed S package currently supports 17 packages and the NMDC supports 12 of those packages. However, the NMDC does not support any human associated packages, but I will be talking about the human gut mixed S packages as that's my focus. So these mandatory metadata fields are the in, um, fields that are required across all mixed S environmental packages. And these shared mandatory metadata fields are what um, the NMDC is going to require as mandatory metadata. Uh, the Genomic Standards Consortium supports five types of data, but the NMDC only supports metagenomic checklists right now. And I'll be focusing on marker genes because I work with 16S data, but also because I think it's the most applicable to our Chime 2 community that works a lot with marker genes. Um, the Invo triad is a hierarchical classification of your sample um, in terms of the environmental context that the sample comes from. So it has these three terms, which is why it's called the Invo triad this broad scale environmental context, local scale environmental context, and environmental medium. So, 
for the herb for the broad scale environmental context i put urban biome this assumes that the human that i took the human gut sample from uh comes from a city but it's the environment in which the individual who the sample came from lives in and then um you go down to a more local scale so it's supposed to be more specific so if i'm collecting fecal samples then that sample came from the gut so i put colon and then environmental medium which is supposed to be some sort of material that you can measure and so i put fecal material so what i really love about this ontology is that it's really attacks this reusable aspect of metadata that we're focusing on um, like when I was looking at urban biome, at first I was like, why does this matter in my sample description? I'm, it's not relevant to my research question. But that's kind of the beauty of this ontology is that it's explaining your sample in a way that is broad enough for it to be relevant to someone else's research question that could have nothing to do with your research question. Something I don't love about this ontology is that I think it's missing some human context, like because it says urban biome colon and fecal matter, it could really be anything living in an urban biome with a colon. So I do think it's kind of missing that context. However, there are places in my metadata that mention that this sample is from a human. So my metadata as a whole isn't missing that, but I do feel like this ontology could be better if it had a little bit more human context. Um, but the NMDC is working with the Genomic Standards Consortium um, on guidelines to make host associated ontologies a little bit easier and address the human context. And then lastly, we have the uh, genomes online database, which has this five level ecosystem path. And so what I really like about this is that it has branches and then you can select a branch like host associated, and it gives you all of the valid branches underneath that. And so from host associated, I could go mammals, human, and then digestive system all the way down to fecal. And so um, the NMDC is bringing both of these together, the Invo triad and the gold ecosystem classification in order to give even more environmental context about your data, but also support that um, fair as or the findable aspect of fair. And so I can look by either the Invo triad terms or the gold ecosystem classification and either way, I will find um, this sample because I have both of these uh, ontologies listed in my metadata. So I think this will start to make a little bit more sense as we get into the weeds of what is required to standardize your metadata. So from the mixed S mandatory metadata fields, there's the sample identification information. So you need an ID that is uh, globally unique. So I use UUIDs, and that allows for my sample ID to be globally unique. And when I submit to a database, there's no chance that another sample has that same ID. And then a sample name, which needs to be consistent within your research project, but doesn't have to be as globally unique as this UUID in the first column. And then there's the investigation type, which is, um, what the mixed S environmental packages call um, your checklist. So for me, that would be my the marker gene. And then the environmental package, which is the environment that you're working in. So for me, that would be human gut. Uh, next on, we're continuing on with sample descriptions from the mixed S mandatory metadata fields. So information about lat long, geographic location, as specific as you can get, and then collection date of your samples, which ideally would include a date and a time, but also can be truncated to just a date if time is not uh, something that was collected. And then there are relevant uh, fields for my package of human gut, so like host subject ID, host age, host sex, host disease state, um, which should be um, chosen from uh, a disease state ontology, and then host body site, host height, and host body temperature. And then there's the sample environment metadata, mandatory metadata fields. And so this includes the 
uh, broad scale environmental biome, the environmental feature, and the environmental material of the IMBO triad, and then also the gold environmental pathway. Let's walk through the NMDC data portal a little bit. So the NMDC data portal is a portal that you can find available data or submit your data. You can, there's a bunch of different omics and environmental data, and you can look at it based on this regional map, this timeline, or by any of the mandatory metadata categories. As you can see here, this has a specific study ID and a collection date and an environmental material that they're looking for, and they can find multiple samples that fit that criteria. And then once you find those samples, you can go and look in for more detail. So here you can see that there's a um, abstract for the research that the sample originally came from and just more information about the sample as well as a data set citation so that you can make sure that you cite this data correctly. I really love the NMDC mission because I believe that it can help with just creating a better scientific community but also in inspiring young scientists. When I was an undergrad, I went to a university that didn't have the resources to sequence data, and so that kind of data wasn't available to me until I found uh, online available data that I was able to download, and then I was able to mess around with some metagenomes. And it was that experience that really clicked it for me and made me decide that I want to do bioinformatics. And so I think that FAIR data is huge in terms of being able to share data, being able to share knowledge, and being able to reuse all of this data we have, but I also think it's super, super important in terms of young scientists who um, need access to data in order to, to be able to try out and, and test these skills. All right, let's standardize some metadata and get it into Chime 2. So this is my example sample metadata, and first I want to orient you guys a little bit so row one contains all of our metadata columns. Row two is our example sample. And row three contains descriptions of what are needed for each metadata column. So now I'm gonna recommend that you pause this video and you go to the Chime2 form, which is linked in the description, and download this metadata so that you can try to standardize it yourself. Then come back and unpause me and we'll go through it and we can see how much you got right and how I standardized this metadata. So I'll be here when you get back. All right, so now that you guys have downloaded this example sample metadata, let's go through it. Um, looking at ID, it says that it needs to be a unique ID that's globally unique. My favorite way to create a globally unique ID is to use a UUID, which stands for Universal Unique ID. And my favorite way to generate UUIDs is by using a program called Qual ID. And so I'm gonna pull up my terminal and I'm gonna activate my Qual ID environment. Uh, in my forum post, I have linked to the Qual ID GitHub, which has instructions for how to install Qual ID, and I'd really recommend it. I love this tool. So I'm activating my Qual ID. And let's look at what we can run. So if I run qual ID, it gives me all of the commands that I can run from qual ID. So I got qual ID create, which creates barcode labels or sample IDs. So um, I'm gonna do this so that I can see what the subcommands of create are. So there's either IDs or labels. And so I'm gonna say qual ID create IDs, and then it wants a, a number after IDs. So I'm gonna say one. I want one universally unique ID. And so I get this one, this is my UUID, and then this is what's called a qual ID. It's not universally unique, but will be unique within your sample. Um, yeah, so the for the ID column though, we want this universally ID, um, unique ID. and Sample 118 is just kind of obviously not universally unique. Looking at sample name, DNA 118 kind of implies to me that it's a biosample label, like a label specifically for the DNA of this sample. And um, 
so yeah, I would I would personally choose a different name. This qual ID. So I just use that qual ID. And so the qual ID fits exactly what the sample name wants. It wants it to be concise and unique and it doesn't contain any information about the sample. And so it, therefore it doesn't give any biases to you as a person analyzing. Uh, for the investigation type, it's a min mark survey, uh, which means marker gene. And then for environmental package, I put human, but that's incorrect. There's a ton of human related packages in the mixes. So we need to do human gut. Looking at Latin long, uh, the only issue, it needs to be in decimal, which it is, but the only issue is I have this like directionalities. We don't need northwest, south, or east. So we're moving those. For geographic location, USA, Arizona is fine if you only have that information. But the more information, the better. So I'm going to put the city. I collected these samples from Glendale. Awesome. And then so collection date. There's two issues with collection date. First of all, if it's a singer, single integer month or day, we want it to be 0, 2, um, as opposed to just 2. And then we also want it to be reported year, month, day, not uh, month, day, year, like it is right now. So I'm going to fix that. Oh, I want to do 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 do. Okay, so that just like re brought it back to the same formatting. So I'm going to switch this to plain text. How I did that was I went to format and then number and then plain text. And this is going to make it so that it doesn't like reformat automatically for me, um, which will allow me to put in the correct format that I want, which is year, month, day. Okay, for host age, uh, the issue is that we need units. So for 20, 23, that could be months or years. And um, it's just better to have units that really specify what it is. Um, this could be a baby that has is 23 months old and um, someone might include it in their study because they think it's a baby, but it's not. And so making sure that you have units to really tell the reader of your metadata what's happening in your metadata is really important. And now we've reached kind of this um, human gut specific information like host age, host sex, host disease state. Um, and host sex is female. So F I assume is female. And uh, the word that the mix S packages wants to use is female. So that's what I used polycystic ovary syndrome for this disease state. I found this from the disease ontology website, but so it's all good. And then host body site um, is intestines. And I also found that for the foundry model of anatomy ontology website. For host height, we want inches. 71 feet seems unreasonable, but again, if you put inches, then it's not up to someone who's reading your metadata to try to decide decide what you meant by it. You're just being specific enough not to need that clarification. And then human body temperature um, is, again, needs units F. And so now we've reached the Invo triad section, which is these three. And so for my broad one, my biome one, we're in an urban And then for environmental feature, that's the colon. And then fecal material. Awesome. And then the gold environmental pathway is good, except for it just needs um, these spaces not to be in there. And after that, we're completely standardized. Um, so let's talk about getting uh, this into Chime 2 and how standardized metadata works in Chime 2. So uh, next, we're going to be validating it for Chime 2. How I do this is by using a tool called Kime, which is an add-on in Google Sheets. So I go to Extensions and then Kime. But if you don't have Kime already installed, you want to go to Extensions, Add-ons, and Get Add-ons. And then you're going to type in Kime to this uh, marketplace, and there it is. 
Uh, this will allow you to like look at an overview and read more information, but also install it. Mine says uninstall because I already have it installed. So now we're gonna go back to extensions, key may, and validate Chime Tune metadata file. Awesome, so we already have a Chime Tune metadata file that is ready to go. There is a couple of things that I wanna show you guys before uh, we move on. So unique, or so if I wanted to mess around and break this, I would add something to this identifiers column. So like if I added unique IDs, I know that this would not be validated in Chime 2 because this identifier column, this first column is really important and it, so it requires very important um, ID, an ID name or a column name. It requires it to be very specific. You can read a little bit about it in the errors um, or you can read a little about it on our metadata tutorial on the Chime 2 uh, website. It will give you information about metadata um, formatting, metadata validation, as well as the identifier column, and much more. And again, that will be linked on my um, forum post that I made. So yeah, unique ID is not a valid name for the identifier column. Another thing that I'll just mention really quickly is that uh, I find that slashes like this cause me some errors in Chime 2, so I try to avoid them. Um, and so when I'm doing dates, I always put dashes in between the dates, and I found that that really easily avoids the problem. So I'm going to revalidate this now that I've changed it back to just ID, and it looks like we're good to go. All right, so another thing that I would talk about in Chime 2 is that Although these units are very important in terms of people reading your metadata for reusability, but for Chime 2, they could actually be an issue because if you're interested in host age as like a numeric variable or a continuous variable, um, having years on the end of it makes Chime recognize it as a categorical variable. And so what we would want is for it to be 23 like it was originally, but we want to make sure that we know our units and that we have them written down somewhere in our um, metadata. So I do something like this. Oh. I make a comment row by putting a pound sign at the beginning and I called it units just so that I'm aware of what this row is. And that allows me to add all of my units to a comment row so it won't affect my Chime 2 analysis. Um, yeah, but I will also remember what the units are for when I'm submitting to a database. And so, oh, I controlled F instead of, um, oops, I'm having some issues. 97. Okay. I'm having some issues. Okay. So now we have all of our units up here. And so this like host age or um, host height or body temperature. Uh, isn't affected by having its units. We can still use it as a numeric variable. So another thing that's cool surrounding types of variables like numeric versus categorical is our Q2 types functionality. I would like to just uh, mention that it's very important that if I have a units row like I do right now, that it's below this Q2 types row. So this Q2 types allows me to force anything into a categorical or numeric value. So say I wanted host age to be numeric and I want it, I want to make sure that it's numeric, then I can put numeric here. Although since it is an integer like 23, Chime 2 will recognize it as a numeric value. But say like host height, I don't want that to be numeric. I want that to be categorical. I can put categorical right there um, and it should not consider this host height numeric, even though 71 is an integer. And then, um, yeah, so that looks good. Let's try to validate again, now with our Q2 types and our units row. Awesome, so we're, we have a validated Chime 2 metadata. So now all it really needs to be done is for us to go into Chime 2. So. 
How to do that is Chime 2 accepts a .tsv file, which stands for tab separated value. So how I do that is I go to downloads and then down to tab separated value. Uh, when I'm working in Google Sheets, this is how I do it. When I'm working in Excel, I think you export as a TSV, but I also think that the TSV extension that it saves it as is a .txt. And Chime 2 doesn't care if it's a .tsv or .txt as long as there's um, a tab separated value format. So I'm gonna download that as a tab separated value and you can see it pop up here. And I'm a, um, and I'm gonna open it in my text editor. And so this is what we see when we open it in my text editor. It's exactly what we were seeing in Excel, except for, uh, except for in a tab separated to value format. And so I'm gonna go to File and Save As just so that I can save it as something that um, is a little bit easier for me to. Access on the command line. Awesome. So saving that. And now I'm going to pull up my command line. So we're in this qual ID uh, conda environment. So I'm going to conda deactivate. And then I'm going to conda activate chime 2 22.2. And then I want to chime tools meta oh no inspect metadata. And then I'm gonna hand it my metadata. And then I'm just uh, auto completing. except for it's not auto-completing, so I don't know why. Oh, I know why. Because uh, I didn't go to downloads. So it's in my downloads. So example, sample, metadata, perfect. And I'm running that. And so since it didn't fail, it's a good sign that this is ready to go for Chime 2, but we can also see all of our um, names and what type of variable they are. So sample name is categorical, host age is numeric, just like we forced it to be by using the Q2 types. All of these are categorical. Notice that host height is categorical because we forced it to be using Q2 types. And host body temperature is numeric because it recognized that those were uh, numbers and so it automatically assigned it to numeric. And that's about it. We're ready to go in Chime 2 and use this for any command. Thank you guys so much for listening to my video. Um, I really hope to have a discussion on the Chime 2 forum, so please comment with any questions you have, anything you learned, anything you would do differently for standardizing metadata. I would really love to have a discussion. Um, yeah, thank you so much.